This is the On the Pony Express podcast. Part of the On3 network. Check out all the SMU coverage you need at ontheponyexpress.com. Now, now. here's your host, Billy Embody. Billy Embody. One, two, three. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I am Billy Embody. Thanks for listening. We are at it this week. SMU is set to tip off in the NIT Wednesday night against Indiana State. But first, guys, we got to remind you that we are presented by our friends at StatusJet. StatusJet.com. You can find them there with all the details about how you can get their premier service when it comes to chartering your next private jet. If you need to sell your plane, buy a plane, they are also available for that. David Henry and his entire team there at Status Jet can help you out with whatever you need uh, when it comes to a luxurious way to travel. You can give them a call at 866-488-3290. You can reach out to them and share the code PONYUPACC for a discount on your round trip with Status Jet. You can also mention on the ponyexpress.com to get that help as well. And they'll hook you up. Uh, we can assure you guys, you guys are in great hands with them over there. And if you need a little bit of help, if you're in a pinch when it comes to a travel plan, they can help you out, uh, get you on a plane quickly and to point, from point A to point B, safely, easily, and with you know the last bit of spring break uh, time coming up or whether it be a big trip in the future, look into them and, and see what they can offer you, your friends, family, when you're looking at planning your next trip. So we appreciate Status Jet, our presenting sponsor and a proud supporter of SMU Athletics as well. Let's jump in here. Last time we spoke, SMU got a commitment. SMU was, and potentially maybe still be, at the bottom when it comes to basketball right now, but they do play on and they will play in the NIT on Wednesday night against Indiana State, a team that won the Mountain Valley uh, Conference as the regular season champs and then ended up losing in the championship of the tournament and therefore are not playing in the NCAA tournament. They're a one seed. SMU will be up in Terre Haute uh, for a 6 p.m. Central matchup on ESPN plus this is the first opportunity to see the Mustangs in the post game in the postseason under Rob Lanier and his staff after just winning 10 games his first year they obviously doubled their win total we know that they've lost five of their last six we know that they are coming off of a quite frankly brutal loss in the AAC tournament to a Temple team that um, even though they advanced well into the AAC tournament and ended up playing for an AAC championship, that is still something where SMU should not have fallen to that team. Uh, Chuck Harris being down or not, that is something that can't happen. And um, look, we met with Rob Lanier Tuesday morning, uh, bright and early, before they traveled up there uh, to Indiana to face uh, Indiana State. And a lot of it, look, we checked it. Checked up on Chuck Harris. Chuck Harris is not 100% by any means, but he is going to play. He was able to practice. Uh, he actually got nicked up again in practice and, and bounced right up, Rob Lanier said. So he's good to go. He's going to play, uh, which will be important for SMU. And uh, at the same time, the transfer portal window is open. There haven't been any SMU players that have entered just yet, but uh, we will be keeping an eye on that because Rob Lanier was pretty straight up uh, when I asked him about the portal and balancing all of that. And he said it's not something that he and his staff uh, really consider to be um, too big of a balance to work through. They can reach these kids very quickly, whether it be FaceTime, phone calls, Zooms, uh, virtual campus tours, things like that. They can get some of these players that they're going to go after. Uh, they can get to them relatively quickly and, and start moving things in the direction they want to. And if SMU does win, uh, this game and does move on. Uh, they will continue to play uh, T, of course, uh, but they'll they'll be able to balance uh, that and still get official visit visitors on campus 
uh, for this because the second round games uh, do not start um, until the 23rd and 24th. So that is Saturday and Sunday. You would be able to host an official visitor during that time as well. So it is kind of just a strange time if SMU were to advance and were to find a way to be at home at some point. Um, I don't think they would be able to. They play against Butler, but they'd be able to get back here at least and and find a way. So that was just something he brought up. I don't really know how it would work out if SMU were to have a home game eventually in the NIT. But the main point is, is they have time to host transfers if they want to during this time. He said the impact players that they need to bring in, they're getting good traction with early on. So I was talking with uh, one of our uh, colleagues and uh, he said, look, I mean, you got to give it to Rob Lanier. He can win a press conference. He can uh, say the right things. And he definitely did that um, Tuesday morning when when meeting with the media. And I think one interesting piece, and then we'll move on. We'll get to football, guys. Don't worry. Trust me. I know some of you are probably throwing your computers or your phones into uh, 75 or, or uh, throwing them out the window of your office building right now listening to basketball talk. But um, they – the right image, at least in press conferences. And uh, he needs to bring in, in impact players, which look, two signees in the 2024 class, Sam Williamson being the only one that is out the door from this team. He's saying right now, there are going to be multiple pieces that move on in all likelihood for SMU. Uh, and that's how you bring in instant impact players, which is what Rob Lanier said they're going to do, and he said there's been good traction on that front already. So whether they're in the portal, whether they're not, I don't know. Uh, but uh, there will be plenty more basketball players that do enter the portal, and SMU has to land quality transfers that can help this team right away when it comes to the ACC. And look, um, I don't really want to get into too much of what's his future on the podcast. I just don't. You know, a lot of people ask me on the board. A lot of people want the gut feeling and things like that. And look, I, I think whenever there are discussions about the future of a program, things can, I don't want to say change in an instant because when you go through your evaluation process of a program, it takes, if you're doing it the right way, it takes time. It should be meticulous. It should be over the course of multiple conversations with the leadership and the coaching staff and even players to an extent. And then you make your decision. And when it comes time to make that final decision and you're going to stick with it or go with it, it is an instant that it can change. So some people who are at that point where they're calling for the head and they want to make a change, there is nothing about SMU playing in the NIT that dictates whether or not a change will be made. But one thing I credit SMU for is that Rob Lanier is continuing to go about his business and continuing to build this program the way he feels like it should be and the way that he wants to. And that is something that's important. And if SMU were to ultimately decide to make a move, then boom, you move on, you pay buyouts, you conduct your search, you do all those things. But the way SMU is handling for a, for a good guy, for, you know, a quality human being, uh, they're going about this the right way. This is, this is an ongoing evaluation as it is year round uh, with a program. And uh, Rob Lanier is going about his work like he is gearing up for the ACC, and he knows that they have to take a considerable jump in the talent that they have. So one other piece that we picked up in the press conference was this. <clears throat> I thought it was interesting that Rob mentioned that the way they set up this schedule was to give them a possibility of being included in the NCAA tournament if they – came down to an at-large bid if they were able to take care of business. Now, we know the rest of that story. SMU did not take care of business down the stretch. They went from creeping up onto that bubble to falling completely flat and, quite frankly, backing their way into the NIT. 
Uh, we know that because there were six teams that said no to the NIT, at least. Who knows if they really would have gotten in, but I'm pretty sure all the te- the six teams that said no weren't were, were going to be in ahead of SMU and were probably going to be seeded too, I'm pretty sure. And SMU is facing a one seed. I mean, they are they are one of the last picks in a sense if you're talking about overall seeding. So um, this program has a lot to do, but Rob Lanier said that during that course of the season when it did get to the point where they were starting to count wins and look at how they were impacted, he felt like some of the players maybe were doing that. And so I think that's obviously on a coaching staff that you've got to control. But maybe it spoke to some of the excitement around the players that, hey, wow, we've got something going here. And they did at that time. They just be starting to ride high and all those things. And they didn't handle it the right way. And they didn't handle it the right way on multiple levels. Uh, there's no question about that. So we'll continue to um, you know, keep an eye on things when it comes to uh, that development piece of the program and him building the culture. Um, you know, as long as, I mean, we're going to be tracking college basketball. I mean, here, it's a big part of our site plan. I mean, SMU's going to the ACC. We're going to track this um, as close as closely as we can, and, and we'll do it day by day as long as, you know, there's a ACC basketball conference for that, that SMU's going to be in and, and compete in because, I mean, this is high-level stuff, and there is a sense around the program that they've got to go out and address this roster and do it with impact players, which we'll find out. You know, Rob Lanier is putting his money or, his, yeah, I guess his money where his mouth is. So uh, we'll see how it all pans out and and go from there. But uh, stay tuned on theponyexpress.com. That's all I can say. When it comes to the football side of things, SMU was back on the practice field on Tuesday. Rhett Lashley spoke with the media kind of quick. You know, it's almost like you're back to day one when it comes to getting back to it for this football team. They were on the field and. Quite frankly, I mean, the the defense, you know, really took it to SMU early on. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see this, uh, some of these clips here. Um, and actually, Rhett Lashley started over this drill. So this is a second iteration of it uh, as the tempo period for SMU. It's usually it's just kind of to get the blood flowing. You don't see too many big plays and things like that, like you do in a normal team period. But um, the defense was able to get a lot of pressure. They were able to uh, kind of create some uh, disjointment. Uh, with the SMU offense early on in practice. And I think a lot of that credit goes to the defensive line and, and just coming ready to play. Rhett Lashley was pretty intense uh, during this team period, the early tempo period, and and at certain points as well throughout practice. I mean, the defense definitely came back ready to go on day one of spring practice after spring break, uh, that is. And I, I think it just continues to speak to where this team is at. You know, it's an offensive line that's missing – two key players in Ben Sparks and Logan Parr. They're going to go out and address the offensive line transfer portal at some point. And, you know, other than that, when and it, it's tough. When you're in practice, and I think we can look back on this and really see, and even back to last spring, the way the defense dominated SMU's offense throughout the course of the last, you know, year. And the offense got, you know, has gotten, you know, its own fair share of, you know, big plays and things like that. Don't get me wrong. But we've seen SMU's defense get after this offense more often than not in practice. I mean, they're one of the best defenses in college football, um, and they're hoping to do that at a higher level when it comes to the ACC. But with Rhett Lashley's offense, you're seeing still some developing that needs to happen. And I think we are starting to see that. Whenever you're in practice and you're going good on good, though, in my opinion, through through my experience, I always seem to think, wow, you can really see when the defense is doing good things and it kind of sticks out to you more than it does when the offense completes a pass, picks up a first down, because it's all not fleshed out in a full spring game or live scrimmage. For the most part, it's all team periods and and seven on sevens and things like that, where it's controlled the number of reps. You don't see a drive develop and things like that. And To that point, though, the defense has been able to step up because of this defensive line. And we know that Blake Burris, the Texas Tech transfer, a big 300-pounder, is going to come in this offseason. We know that they're going to continue to try to address the cornerback spot. We know they're going to try to bring in another defensive lineman. But the offense 
when you don't have your offensive line just completely in order yet, and especially when you're missing some talented depth pieces, then it becomes apparent more quickly when Keldrick Luster comes out. And we saw this at times last year with Kevin Jennings in the second team offense. Wow, it's so apparent that, okay, the defensive second unit is playing at a much higher level than the offense's second unit. And so there's going to be days that the offense is going to bounce back and and make plays and do all of those things. And Kevin Jennings, honestly, I mean, I, I've been really impressed with him in, in spring practice, just what he's been able to do, being able to throw the football over all over the yard, really. And I think he is starting to develop a pretty good rapport with, with guys like Ashton Cozart and Jordan Hudson. Those are two guys on the outside that really stepped up nicely in spring. And, and Keyshawn Smith has been kind of the king of acrobatic contested grabs. And then Jake Bailey has had an awesome spring. He had a really nice practice on Tuesday as well, just making some plays over the middle. And and again, it's hard. People always say, oh, what about the running backs? Well, they just don't get that opportunity to flash because you're not playing complete downhill, physical, through the whistle, try to break a tackle, trying to do it the right way. And that's where sometimes it's just not easy to get a look at these running backs. But what you can get a look at is the offensive and defensive lines. And, you know, I just think that SMU's offensive line is, is still developing. But, you know, Justin Osborne, you know, being at center, getting some looks at right guard has been relatively uh, good for SMU, I would say. Justin had some moments today where, where a couple snaps were wide early, but he got them under control quickly. And, and I think the big thing with Justin is he's such a pro in the middle. And so he's been fairly impressive for SMU on the offensive line this spring in his new role. And that's, you know, something that Garen Justice has really relied on him for. I mean, this is an important position to to make sure SMU nails this year. And Justin Osborne is about as mature of a, of a player and an offensive lineman as you're going to find. And so he, SMU's offense is going to get back to a level like we saw this past year where they're a very good unit and they're able to keep Preston Stone or Kevin Jennings clean, it's going to be because Justin Osborne has been able to make the calls. He's been able to stay healthy. And, and that's been very important for him this spring, too, is, is having these reps. And he's not recovering from an injury. And, and so he's somebody that SMU fans should be pretty excited about. But I kind of alluded to one area that I wanted in terms of some spring takeaways and, and some of the guys that are really emerging. And granted, SMU just had a week off. It was spring break. They're back on the practice field now, and and they're going through it, and they're getting after it again. And and it's kind of a difference whenever you're able to to go from you know day one where these guys are in shorts and t-shirts, and they have to do that for a couple of days, and then it comes back together, and you get into pads, and then quickly you're in you're at spring break before you know it. Uh, six practices, I think, SMU had before spring break only four of them were in pads and so you don't get to really establish your groove but once you got back from spring break I was pretty impressed with the tempo that SMU at least went with the execution offensively on Tuesday wasn't as good as you would have liked to have seen and this is these are clips from earlier in spring ball if you're watching on YouTube but the defense and offense both brought it I felt like from a tempo and accomplishing what they wanted to with regards to practice and practicing with a purpose, I just think the defense got very much the best of the offense uh, on Tuesday when we were out there. But as you as you break for spring break and you say, okay, all right, there's a, a few guys that are catching our eye. And, and can you keep developing and making play and not just saying, okay, I've had six good practices. I've impressed the coaches. I, they know I can play now. I can kind of take my foot off the gas. You out there, and Jordan Hudson had some of really impressive acrobatic grabs. I thought RJ Maryland on Tuesday had a really nice practice, had, again, a couple acrobatic grabs. And and Jordan is really competing at a high level with a guy like Deuce Harmon, who has had really good coverage. But Jordan Hudson's starting to emerge as that ball winner that we know he can be. And, and there's a reason why he, again, I, don't look at the stats uh, you know, right in front of me, but 
pretty sure led the team in receiving touchdowns in, in 2023. And that's because he wins balls and he, and he makes competitive plays on the balls. And we're starting to enter the point where now that we've come back from spring break, we've seen another practice. You're like, okay, Jordan Hudson didn't take a day off. He didn't ease back in. He was right back at it. And I think that's important from a, from a maturity and a mentality standpoint that he shows that ability to really step up for this team because that's what he has to do. And he has to keep keep that going this summer and then keep it going in the fall and then the season. So he's been really impressive. I think another offensive piece that is really emerging and people are going to be really excited about once they really get a look at him uh, is, is you're going to love Brashard Smith. Uh, he is really, really fun to watch. Um, you know, watching uh, – these guys work out in the spring in the uh, screen game uh, for SMU is really impressive. And, and there was a drill we were watching with Maurice Crum and, and the linebackers along with uh, the, the running backs. And they were able to just get out there uh, and uh, you know, be able to make plays on the edge and, and, and compete in a small area. And Burchard Smith is one of those guys that always impresses in those drills. He's able to make, the short catch and turn it into something. Um, he just has that explosiveness and he showed it in the uh, team period as well. And I think that's something that's uh, in, important is that SMU, and we talked about this earlier uh, in the spring, SMU needs guys that can make, and actually Craig James mentioned this on the podcast as well. It, it has become so important in college football that you have guys that just solve problems and they saw when, when def good defenses are called, they're the answer because they're so athletic and they're so much better than other people. And Brashard Smith is one of those guys. He is that good. He's going to be really fun for SMU fans to watch because they can get him in space and he's so fast. They can get him going and be able to make big plays down the field or a quick hitter and it and it goes for a big gain up the middle because he's got that explosive speed and he put that on display a couple of times in spring practice today uh, on Tuesday at least as I'm recording this so there are still unanswered questions but those are a couple guys uh, along with Ashton Cozart who's really having a good spring that are merging in my opinion on offense when it comes to the defense it has to start with a conversation around Teddy Knox who is just having a terrific spring as he's adjusting more to that cornerback spot. He's been able to really, really show why he he's made the move. He's not technically sound. He's not perfect by any means, but his recovery, he had one that was right in front of me on Tuesday where you could tell the receiver made a great move, kind of got some separation, but he was able to close that gap. And I even said to the person next to me, ball was in there. I said, watch this. and boom, there's Teddy, Teddy Knox closing the gap. And I think that's something that at the corner spot, you talk about solving problems. When you aren't a good enough athlete, and there are guys that can overcome this, but when you, are, when you aren't a good enough athlete to make up for when you do guess wrong or you do get turned around by a receiver, boy, it's going to look really bad. But when you have high-end speed like Teddy does to recover, that's something that can't be taught. There, as much technique as you want to go through, you can't teach that type of speed. And I would put Teddy up just about probably top three fastest guys on the team off the top of my head. He's he's just really had a nice spring for himself, and he's cemented himself as somebody that they are probably starting to count on for next season in the cornerback room. So – I'm excited to see his continued development. Jonathan McGill had a really strong start to practice as well, and and he continues to – so he's elevating his game. That whole safety room is really, really impressive. And I think the defensive line, there's so much competition that we're seeing a lot of these players really have to step up and and make plays and and to earn that early trust from Calvin Thibodeau. And that's what he's searching for is guys that he can trust – guys that want to push each other and compete. If you watch him out there at spring ball, he's kind of going at his own guys. And, you know, the sarcasm meter is, it's not sarcastic, but the sarcastic jokes are are kind of off the charts there. And 
that's how he's able to try and motivate a lot of these guys. And behind the scenes, who knows what the converse, conversations are, but he really does, you know, bring that out of a lot of players is, you know, just giving them a little grief over a, a rep or, uh, you know, taking a playoff, you know, with the big guys, it, it's hard to be on every single rep, but, you know, that's what he kind of demands out of those guys. And, and I think you look at a guy like Jafar I. Harvey, uh, who's really emerged as a go-to guy and, and Isaiah Smith has really stepped up and been able to be right there with them. They're both very different looking players. They're both very different edge rushers, but I look at those two and if you can see what their future looks like next year and you think about Elijah Roberts being opposite of them, it, it's it got a potential to be pretty fun for this defense to to generate a pass rush and and solve problems potentially here and there for moments where a defensive back gets turned around or a linebacker can't get to his own quick enough. And if you can get to the quarterback, then you can solve that problem. So. A lot of good takeaways. We're just back at it now. Rest me on the practice field, uh, but it's it's trending in the right way for this team. Quick reminder before we continue, guys. Once again, statusjet.com. Head over there. Talk with Dave about what they can do for you. They've got large jets, medium-sized jets, small jets, helicopters. And if you are in a pinch, just reach out to them. Start the conversation ahead of time so that if something were to happen to your travel plans, or your mode of transportation, you can reach out to Status Jet. They already know you, you know them, and they can hook you up and get you from point A to point B safely, quickly, efficiently, and in that luxurious way you'd expect from a charter jet experience. So we're trending in the right way of being able to talk more about the uh, SMU Stanford trip and a couple other opportunities for you guys as, as football season begins. So be on the lookout for that. I know we keep talking about it, but we're just trying to make sure it's all good before we release it and kind of start doing that process. But reach out to Status Jet. Pony Up ACC is your code for a discount on a round trip flight. And then also just mention on theponyexpress.com and subscribe to on theponyexpress.com if you don't already. It's just a dollar. That's it. Just a dollar for your first month gets you through the rest of spring ball. All of our coverage from myself, Jordan Hoffaditz, Kevin Longquist. Uh, our national guys, Chad Simmons, I mean, one of the deans of recruiting nationally has been dropping by our message board as well, sharing some stories on some prospects. So lots of good things going for us at On3 right now. We're excited about the future as well. So uh, guys, before we go, let's hit on a couple things with recruiting here. Um, official visits continue to get set. We're going to take an early look to cap this podcast on one of the top visitor lists that SMU fans can look at when it comes to uh, this program and, and what they're going to bring on campus next month, uh, excuse me, almost next month, uh, but in May. And the May 10th recruiting weekend is shaping up to be a big one. And you see the May 17th recruiting weekend, that's obviously getting huge. That's getting out of control. We're going to see, that we're going to share with our subscribers tons of info on all these weekends that are coming up and where things stand with these recruits. But you look at, I mean, four highly recruited prospects coming to campus that May 10th weekend, Elijah Barnes, one of the, one of the top uh, linebackers in the entire country will be on campus. Uh, he's from Dallas skyline. So the product uh, uh, Isaiah Wachovia, who was uh, at skyline as a, as a recruit, uh, he went, he goes to the same high school or went to the same high school that Elijah does. So there's some, some ties there. He's uh, somebody that SMU's really hoping that the staying home piece really pans out. Some family. Uh, but he is uh, one of the high, highest recruited guys in the country. He was just at LSU. He's at Ohio State. As I'm recording this, he, he'd be a massive piece for SMU in this class of 2025. You also have Ricky Stewart, a former SMU pledge making his way to campus. He is teammates, of course, with Demetrius Brisbane. Those two in the backfield form one of the top duos in the entire country when it comes to production. They're going to be back at SMU once again for official visits. So SMU is going to hope to get Ricky on board or back on board, I should say. We'll see. It's going to be a tough battle for him. Uh, and, and SMU has three safeties committed already. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Demetrius Brisbane as well. 
But they're not just bringing in Ricky Stewart in the backfield. They're bringing in Jasper Parker, who's kind of a new addition. But he is a very, very highly recruited prospect at this point out of the New Orleans area. Goes to Archbishop Shaw uh, and, and is really one of the top running backs in the region. He picked up Alabama. He's picked up Florida State. He's got Oklahoma State. He's going to check out. But he's going to officially visit SMU May 10th. And I think he might come down for an unofficial before that. But, you know, Kyle Cooper has really honed in on him as, as one of his options for this class of 2025. And he had 20 over 20 touchdowns last year. For, uh, he split time uh, with with uh, a bunch of backs so uh, or a couple backs uh, when he was at Holy Cross as well. So he has the potential to really be a, a breakout type of prospect as the summer turns into the fall for these senior years he's he's somebody that you know again you you aren't you aren't where you are as a prospect when you have alabamas and programs like that offering you in the month of january of your junior year when you're recruiting you know start to really heat up so jasper is a really good fit for smu too i'm interested to see how things go on that official and if SMU can can reel him in. We'll talk more about a lot of the big recruits that are coming to campus throughout the rest of spring. We'll do a recruiting pod here soon. Cody Belair, our national scout, is actually going to join me on a podcast. We're going to record it this week and then probably drop it next. All the SMU commits, talk about them as prospects and, and really dive into that. So that'll be a really cool conversation for you guys to hear as well. Spring is continuing to roll on. About eight pra eight practices are left now. So I'll be out there as long as uh, my baby boy hasn't shown up yet. But uh, if not, we'll have all your coverage taken care of. We've got that all worked out. So don't you guys worry on that front. And and while the podcast might take a brief break when that happens soon enough. So hope you guys enjoyed kind of a midweek podcast on a bunch of things, basketball, football, recruiting. We will be back with another edition of the podcast later this week. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on with the ACC when it comes to realignment and all the lawsuits and stuff. That just happened before I recorded this one, so I didn't want to just jump in and, and you know, just ramble on about that when I don't really know too much about what all is going on. So we'll dive into that a little bit later, but hope you guys enjoyed this edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. Please hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. And also check out on theponyexpress.com. If you subscribe already, spread the word to your friends. Tell them, hey, you got to subscribe. It's just a dollar. So appreciate all the support, you guys. And we will catch you next time with another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. Thanks for listening to the On the Pony Express podcast with Billy Embody. Follow us on your socials on X at SMU on three and on Instagram at on three SMU. And keep it locked to ontheponyexpress.com for more coverage.